Well, <clears throat> good morning. And welcome to the 2014 Consumer Food Safety Education Conference. Uh, we're extremely glad that you're all here. We also welcome all the individuals who are watching this conference online. <clears throat> it is being broadcast live. So keep smiling. <laughs> so can I get a show of hands of how many have attended one of the previous food safety education conferences? We love repeat business. <clears throat> So if you've attended a prior conference, you know we pack a lot of programming into a short amount of time, and that we're all about providing an experience that will help launch you into new levels of success in your consumer food safety education outreach work. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to open this conference on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Partnership for Food Safety Education, we welcome you to the Washington, D.C. area. I'm Stan Hazen, and I'm the Voluntary Board Chair for the Partnership. And in my day job, I am the Director of Regulatory Affairs for NSF International. Uh, <clears throat> the NSF mission since 1944 has been the protection of human health and the work of the partnership dovetails very nicely into the work that we do as well. And so we're very proud to have been involved with this conference since 2006. And we're also delighted to be a sponsor of this conference. The Partnership for Food Safety Education is so much more than just the Fight Back campaign. The partnership is dedicated to making consumer food safety education more collaborative, more effective, and more visible. I encourage you to take advantage of the webinars, materials, and other resources available to you through the partnership. Let me encourage you, there it is. Let me encourage you, as we kick things off, to use the conference app. No? Yes. <clears throat> to use the conference app. It is easy to use, and here's how to download it to your device. You are a self-select group of the most accomplished and committed heroes in this area of consumer food safety education. The reason that we are here this week is to harness the talent, the commitment, and put to work strategies proven to increase attitudinal and behavioral modification of safe food handling behaviors. You can expect to take home from this conference actionable data, tools, and improved skills to be even more effective in your work to educate and engage consumers on the preventive health practices of clean, separate, cook, and chill. At the last conference in Atlanta, Georgia in 2010, 94% of attendees in a survey reported they would be making changes to their practices as a result of the information presented at the conference. That's 94%. That's a very significant number. And we consider that a huge success. <clears throat> and so we're equally optimistic about the outcomes from this conference, that you'll take away practices, uh, learnings, and connections to change the way that you conduct your food safety education outreach. <clears throat> we consider this conference to be your tune-up and your battery recharge. So let's check in on the aims of this conference. They are ambitious, and we know you are ready to lead on these challenges. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, so we're here to advance knowledge and practice in support of Healthy People 2020 goals to encourage dialogue about proven strategies for consumer behavior change in food safety, to support you in developing you as leaders in food safety education, and to create memorable opportunities for you to connect and share with others. So are you ready to get started? Yes. Are you ready to get started? Yes. Excellent. 
So before we move into the plenaries, I want to introduce the person who works every day tirelessly to put the fight and fight back. That is Executive Director of the Partnership Food Safety Education, your very own Shelley Feist. Coming and outgoing. Thank you, Stan. Stan's one of the terrific volunteers who not only was responsible for putting this conference together, but also for putting the partnership on track under its new strategic direction to be a catalytic leader in, in health education and a trusted partner to all of you. Um, I have three areas to cover in my short time with you. Uh, one is we, the partnership, and this backfighter community. We have some goals, right? And we're going to talk a lot about these goals today. Conveniently, these are important, high-priority goals that were set by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Healthy People 2020 goals that are specific to food safety. So these goals are top line. One, to reduce infections caused by key pathogens transmitted commonly through food. And to increase the proportion of consumers who follow key food safety practices. And if you go to this great website, um, objectives sub-area of Healthy People 2020, each of the specific behaviors and the measurements towards those behaviors are, are spelled out. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. You'll be hearing more about these goals and the efforts to measure progress towards these goals from Dr. Patricia Griffin of the CDC and in several breakout sessions during the conference. But knowing the importance of making progress in these goals, that's what really drives our work at the partnership. And that's what motivated us in planning this conference. We're going to get kicked off right away with some live polling here because we want to know from you, do you feel confident that we will meet these Healthy People 2020 food safety goals as a nation? by 2020. So uh, you can quite easily participate in this poll on your device. You can either use the app, you can go to the URL biz.bo slash 0775, and at that URL, you'll be able to vote, or you can, you can text. Um, so we have some data that demonstrates the need for an increased focus on the consumer behaviors of food thermometer use, proper hand washing and produce handling in particular. And at this conference, you will have access to some great breakout sessions that address each of these um, important areas of safe food, safe handling behaviors at home. Um, my second area to cover at this opening session is to sum up for you who's here today. Who are the talented leaders in this room that are gonna help us get to these goals by 2020? Because it's only five years away. Um, Here's who's with us today. Uh, Cooperative Extension, shout out, 50%. <laughs> Federal government, industry, nonprofits, state and local government, and, and some internationals are with us today. So thank you. That's, that's who's here. And um, needless to say, we'd love you all to meet many people that you have not previously met before at the conference. We know from the health and food safety educators we're in touch with that about a quarter of them report reaching more than 500 consumers directly each year. And 56% report that they reach between 50 and 500 people each year. So this multiplier effect is extremely important to this decentralized work in food safety education and can be leveraged to meet the Healthy People 2020 goals. So that's very powerful. Um, I want to thank you for making this commitment to work on these common goals and for sticking to it because making progress on these goals requires collaboration and persistence and work over time. So I'm already at my third reason for being up here, and that's to thank the many people who helped to make this conference possible. First, there's you for being willing to take time out from your busy schedules to be with us today. Uh, we've had a terrific group of volunteers from the federal agencies, from industry, from consumer groups and academia. A truly impressive group helped put together this conference, the program, and our outreach and marketing work. So on page eight of your program book, 
you will find a full list of those people. Uh, in addition, the, the organizations that provide the core operational funding for the partnership, this is done by, in, by donations from our contributing partners. They're listed on the back cover of, inside back cover of the, of the programming book. Now those people and those organizations are very important. I want to recognize Ashley Bell and Brittany Sanier. They're both in the room here. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Britt. <laughs> that is the partnership staff, and so you'll, you'll get to know them, and many of you maybe already know them through our uh, email marketing and our programming. And Diane Henderson and Christine Garrett for their conference logistics and support have done a great job. <laughs> Finally, as you know, it takes uh, resources to put on a conference like this. Um, the following sponsor organizations have made an investment in this conference and in you because they are also committed to making progress on Healthy People 2020 and they support your role in that. Um, our conference sponsors are the American Meat Institute Foundation, Ecolab, the FMI Foundation, the Grocery Manufacturers Association, the Illinois Institute of Technology, Institute for Food Safety and Health, NSF International, the Produce Marketing Association, and Walmart. So please join me in a round of applause to thank these sponsors. So before we introduce or welcome our first speaker, I want to bring up the poll results. I think that has to be done by the crew in the back here. They're going to bring up the results, what you all had to say about how you feel about our collective progress on Healthy People 2020 goals. All right. Well, overall, <laughs> optimistic. 40% say yes. 27% say no. We'll work on those people. And 32% uh, are not sure. But that's very interesting, isn't it? I I'm, was very interested in what you all thought about that. Thank you. All right, we'll go back to my slide for, I am very happy today to introduce our first speaker who represents the nation's health protection agency, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which saves lives and protects people from health threats. The CDC tackles big problems, and as you know, they've been in the news a lot lately. We're very pleased to welcome Dr. Patricia Griffin, to open this conference. Dr. Griffin received her Doctor of Medicine degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, trained in internal medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, in gastroenterology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and in mucosal immunology at the University of Pennsylvania, and in epidemiology at the CDC. Dr. Griffin is chief of the Enteric Diseases Epidemiology Branch. The branch conducts surveillance for illness caused by enteric bacteria throughout the United States, tracks changes in incidence, determines risk factors for illness, and investigates outbreaks. Um, she'll talk about some of these branch programs, including the Foodborne Diseases Active Surveillance Network, FoodNet, the Foodborne Disease Outbreak Surveillance System, and the Human Epidemiology Arm of the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System for Enteric Bacteria. The branch also provides consultation to other countries. Dr. Griffin has authored or co-authored over 200 journal articles, book chapters, and other publications, and she holds an adjunct appointment in the Emory University Rollins School of Public Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patricia Griffin. Thank you, Shelley, and good morning. I, um, when Stan did that survey, I was holding my arm down because I wanted to say I'd been at the last meeting because I worked 
hard with Chris Prue in making the agenda for the meeting in 2010 at CDC, but I had to be somewhere else. So it's especially nice that I get to come actually to this meeting. So we will start and see if I can work this thing. Um, food safety is one of uh, CDC's designated public health winnable battles because it's one of those issues in which our director thinks we can make significant progress in a short period of time and affect the lives of many people. CDC is a non-regulatory agency. We track human illness, and for us to be effective, we need to work very closely with the regulatory agencies, FDA and USDA, who regulate food and food animals. CDC provides the vital link for improving the safety of food by linking practices on farms, in production plants, and in kitchens to ill people. I'll talk today about some of CDC's roles. These include providing data and analyses to guide policy, advancing technology for faster, better control and prevention, and detecting, investigating, and stopping outbreaks. And I'll give you some examples of these. So for example, FoodNet is our foodborne diseases active surveillance network. It covers 48 million people in 10 sites. Some are whole states and some are parts of states. FoodNet provides data for the food safety progress report that we issue every spring with data from the previous year. And if you look down uh, the arrows and the faces, you'll see that we had um, last year an increase in Campylobacter illnesses and an increase in Vibrio illnesses. Others had no change. Those were E. coli 157, Listeria, Salmonella, and Yersinia. The little targets that are hard to see, and it would be hard for me to use this pointer to get at them, um, show our Healthy People 2020 goals, some of those that Shelley mentioned. And the writing on the right is a reminder that we just track lab-confirmed infections. But for many of our pathogens, um, there are 25 or 30 more illnesses estimated to occur for everyone that's lab confirmed. And that's certainly true for Campylobacter, E. coli 157, and Salmonella. FoodNet also provides data that allowed us to estimate the annual number of foodborne illnesses caused by known pathogens. And that includes both lab confirmed and not lab confirmed. And we estimated 9 million illnesses, 56,000 hospitalizations, and 1,300 deaths. Now, is anybody having trouble hearing me? Raise your hand if you're having any trouble. And if it happens during the talk, stand up and shout at me. Um, another of our surveillance systems is foodborne disease outbreak reporting. And you can see from this graph that CDC has been doing this since 1973. And you can also see that the colors changed, and with that, the average annual number of outbreaks reported changed. And this is due to improvements in the surveillance system. From dark blue to light blue, we went from a paper-based system to electronic. And when we turned uh, green, that's when we improved our definitions of a foodborne outbreak. So we get about 800 outbreak reports a year, and they tell us a lot about what are the foods that, pe that are making people sick, where are they eating them, what are the problems that cause those outbreaks. This outbreak data has allowed us to make um, our first comprehensive attribution estimates that we published last year. We estimated the percentage of foodborne illnesses caused by known pathogens due to each food category. And you can see the first set of bars um, shows in light blue that we estimate 46% of illnesses were associated with eating produce. And going down to the next set, we estimated that 29% of deaths were associated with uh, eating meat and poultry. PulseNet is our national molecular subtyping network for foodborne disease surveillance. It connects cases of illness nationwide to quickly identify outbreaks, including many that would otherwise not be detected. So public health laboratories analyze the bacterial DNA from ill patients. For example, a salmonella that, that made somebody sick is sent to the public health laboratory. They 
they grind it up and look at the DNA and they get these pulse field gel electrophoresis patterns that they send over the internet to the national database at CDC. And there, teams search for similar PFGE patterns. And when a cluster is identified, they report it to the epidemiologists who look for a common source. And you can see here, each row, look at um, the, the red box, each row is a PFG pattern of one isolate from one person. And there's a cluster of four rows in which the, those barcodes look the same. And that suggests that even though those people may be scattered across the country, they may have gotten sick from a common source. So PulseNet is helping us in detecting, investigating, and responding to multi-state outbreaks. And you can see from the bar graph that multi-state outbreaks are being detected more frequently every year. Um, over 100 in the most recent five-year period we looked at. Along with this, the median number of illnesses per multi-state outbreak is decreasing. It peaked at 69 in the 1990s. May, so many of you probably remember getting a lot of notices about these big outbreaks. Well, now we have more outbreaks, but they're smaller. The average number is 35 in the 2000s. And that's because we're detecting these outbreaks faster, and that's coupled with rapid public health action to get contaminated products off the market. So we've identified 22 new food vehicles in multi-state salmonella outbreaks since 2006. No, I'm not going to read you this entire list. Um, but you, you'll be familiar uh, with many of them. They were, they were all uh, reported in the media and on CDC's website. And we continue to identify new products every year. And that's part of our role, to just be on the lookout, to not expect the expected, to be looking for the unusual, the cookie doughs, the things that you might not expect, the dog food that's making people sick. Um, here are some of our web postings from 2013. We post reports as the outbreak's occurring, not after it's over. We let you know what's going on. And the media gets very interested in these reports. These are some of the media reports um, just from 2014. And you can see on the, um, in the middle right, salmonella in 10 states linked to bean sprouts. I'll talk a bit more about that one. Um, Multi-state outbreaks have major impact. Many require a national level response because people are scattered throughout the country. They often reveal important gaps in the food safety system that result in system-wide improvements. And there are major implications for food safety policy in government and industry. So I now want to turn to some of our food safety challenges and uh, I chose to talk about six, and the first two are pathogens, salmonella and norovirus. So this graph shows the fall and rise of reported salmonella infections for almost 100 years. And you can see in the white, and that's, that's salmonella typhi. It's um, a severe disease, and it decreased partly because we separated human feces from food and water, because this organism is carried only in the intestines of people. Animals don't carry it. So that when we achieved that, we reduced those illnesses almost to nothing, and almost all of our cases now are imported from other countries. But look what happened in the mid-50s. The yellow shows the increase in non-typhoidal salmonella. Those organisms are carried in all of our food animals. And those illnesses increased partly because agriculture became industrialized. Non-typhoidal salmonella infection is usually diarrheal with fever and abdominal pain. Incubation period is up to 48 hours. And people are sick for about a week with a pretty bad diarrhea. But 5% of disease is invasive, meaning bacteria are in the blood or in usually sterile sites like the lining of the brain or in the bones. And as you can imagine, this is a severe disease, and it's most common in infants and in the elderly. So this shows more recent incidents of salmonella infections that we've been tracking in FoodNet since 1996. 
Um, that green line is quite disappointing considering our healthy people goal in 2010. We became less aggressive in 2020, but we're still not meeting that goal. And remember, many more illnesses occur than are reported. So we have a lot of work to do on salmonella. Um, norovirus is estimated to be the number one cause of foodborne illness in the United States. It causes vomiting with diarrhea, and people are usually ill for about two days. It's the most common source of uh, foodborne, um, the most common source of foodborne norovirus outbreaks is foods that are eaten raw, um, often contaminated by an Ill, Ill food handler. And you educators know this problem that a uh, survey of ill restaurant workers found that one in five reported working while sick with diarrhea and vomiting. And that's it's pretty sad to think they're trying to work while they're still sick, but it's because they want to get paid. Um, so it's a difficult problem and it causes a lot of illnesses. I'll now talk about antibiotic resistance. Um, last year, CDC issued the Antibiotic Threats Report. It's the first time a report like this was written for the United States, and it provided data on 18 resistant threats. Now, two of them are transmitted commonly by food and also have animal reservoirs. And those are salmonella that's resistant to ceftriaxone or ciprofloxacin or five or more classes of antibiotics. And campylobacter resistant to ciprofloxacin or azithromycin. And as many of you know who've been sick or whose kids have been sick, cipro is a pretty commonly used drug and we don't want things to be resistant to it. Ceftriaxone is also a really important drug. It's given intravenously for severe infections, and you really don't want bacteria to be resistant to it. I'll talk a bit more about, um, hmm, this is not advancing. I wonder if the batteries ran out. Oh, there it is, okay. Just, it was just slow, fell asleep. Is anybody else asleep beside the slides? Okay. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about salmonella resistant to ceftriaxone, but first, I think it is the batteries. I um, want to remind you that the use of antibiotics is the single most important factor leading to antibiotic resistance around the world. We'll just have to hit it several times now to get it going. Um, and let's talk about antibiotics in food animals. A large proportion of antibiotics sold in the United States are used in food animals. They are FDA approved to treat disease, to prevent infection, and to promote growth. Most have been used to promote growth, not for animal health. This purpose is no longer allowed in the EU countries, and a year ago, FDA issued guidance intended to voluntarily phase out use for promoting growth by 2017. So we're looking to see what happens in that area. All right. This is a complicated slide. I said I'd tell you about ceftriaxone. The message is simple and clear. I'd probably take longer to try to fix it, so I'll just push it a couple times and you'll put up with me. So is it, the message here is really clear. The bottom line is that everything is going up. And let me just lead you through this. Um, the title, ceftriaxone resistance among salmonella serotype Heidelberg. It's a type of salmonella. And we're looking at humans, chickens, retail chicken, and retail ground turkey. And if you look in the far left, the yellow bar shows that from humans, only 3% of isolates were resistant to ceftriaxone in 1996. And if you look in the far right, you'll see that 15% of those salmonella strains are now resistant to ceftriaxone. At the same time, all the other lines are going up. The other lines are chickens, retail chicken, and retail ground turkey. There's a couple times when those lines touch the baseline, and I wouldn't put too much um, credence on that because each of the, uh, the dots, the numbers, are very small. We have very small um, numbers of, of isolates that we're testing. So we're looking at general overall trends. Um, so now I'll talk about some foods and start with poultry. Poultry is the food most commonly implicated in foodborne disease outbreaks. In the past decade, poultry has been responsible for about a quarter 
of outbreak-associated illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths. This graph shows the percentage of retail meat samples yielding Campylobacter. And about 46% of retail chicken is contaminated with Campylobacter. And by retail chicken, what I mean is the chicken that you would buy in your grocery store. These are just packages of chicken that investigators pick up from stores in uh, FoodNet sites and a few other sites. And you can see that, that there are very little Campylobacter in ground turkey, ground beef, and pork chops. So then look, let's look at the same graph for salmonella. And that shows 12% of retail chicken and ground turkey yield salmonella, but very few ground beef or pork chop samples yielded salmonella. We had a multistate outbreak of salmonella serotype Heidelberg infections from chicken that lasted over a year and a half and just ended last summer. 634 people were sickened in 29 states and 38% were hospitalized. The outbreak strain was found on chicken from three slaughter and processing facilities of the same producer, on breasts, wings, and whole birds. Improvements were clearly needed at many points. Uh, the farms, in the processing plants, in the warehouse store that roasted whole birds and then recontaminated them, um, food handlers in restaurants, and consumers. A lot of education is needed here about handling chicken um, because uh, of the contamination that we're dealing with. I want to talk about produce. This is the same slide I showed you earlier. That top bar shows that we estimate 46% of illnesses are due to consumption of produce. And I'll give you one example, but to give the example, I have to talk a little bit about listeria. It's a very rare illness, um, and it, it tends not to hit healthy people. It hits people in certain risk groups. The elderly get bloodstream infection or meningitis. Persons with immunocompromising conditions also get this severe illness. Pregnant women get a flu-like illness, but then they have a miscarriage or a stillbirth. And the newborns get the severe illness. So you may remember our listeria outbreak from cantaloupe in 2011. It made a lot of news because it was the largest ever outbreak of listeriosis. 147 people were sickened, 33 died, and there was one um, mis who miscarried. Um, rapid identification of the food source using PulseNet and Listeria Initiative questionnaires, we estimate prevented about 36 illnesses and seven deaths. And you can see that the patients were scattered throughout the country in 28 states. The environmental assessment found that the processing facility was the most likely source of contamination. Outbreak strains were found on cantaloupes and on surfaces at the facility. And deficiencies include that the melons were not cooled after harvest, the equipment was designed and used improperly, and sanitation was inadequate. So here there's a lot of room for education at the farm and processing level. This is just one slide on one other produce outbreak, and I'm mentioning it because it's going on right now. It's a multi-state outbreak of serotype enteritidis infections linked to mung bean sprouts. Um, in our last posting on November 24th, 68 people were sickened in 10 states, and 26% were hospitalized. But look for an update from CDC this week on this outbreak. So our last um, challenge I'll discuss is raw dairy products. We did an analysis of outbreaks due to non-pasteurized dairy products from 1993 through 2006. We found 56 milk outbreaks, and 82% of them were associated with raw milk. And compared with pasteurized milk outbreaks, raw milk outbreaks had an 11 times higher hospitalization rate, um, probably because all of them were caused by bacteria. Now, the estimated risk of an outbreak is about 150 times higher per pound for raw than for pasteurized dairy product. This bar graph shows the actual average annual number of outbreaks due to raw milk. Um, you can see the first bars are for a longer period, 1993 through 2006. We got a few per year, and the orange bars show total outbreaks 
the white bars show those outbreaks that were caused by Campylobacter. So most of the outbreaks are caused by Campylobacter. But look at the later periods. 07 to 09, we saw a marked increase in the average number of outbreaks. And 2010 through 2012, it increased further. So clearly, this, this is a big and difficult area for food safety education. You're seeing more and more of these outbreaks. So I now want to talk about some successes that inspire and guide us. Um, first, Vibrio vulnificus. Foodborne Vibrio vulnificus infection is a rare disease, but about 50% of patients die. Patients develop fever, sepsis, and skin lesions. Um, people who get the disease tend to have high-risk conditions, um, mainly liver disease, alcoholism, and diabetes. And raw oysters are the most important source. So, um, so back in the 90s, California decided to attack this problem by requiring warning signs in restaurants. Um, and they continued to have illnesses, and the black bars showed the deaths. Then they required that the warnings be in English and Spanish. And we may have seen a decline. It looks like a decline in illnesses. But then they weren't satisfied with that. And they required that raw Gulf Coast oysters harvested in the warm months be treated so that this organism is not detectable. And since then, since 2003, they've had no vulnificus illnesses from raw oysters. Pretty, pretty effective intervention. E. coli O157 has also um, seen some success. Just to remind you about this illness, it starts by ingesting the organism, and then you develop non-bloody diarrhea and abdominal cramps that often becomes quickly bloody and tends to resolve in about a week. But some people develop hemolytic uremic syndrome, and that's more likely in young children. And that's anemia with fragments of red blood cells, low platelet count, and kidney failure. It's a severe disease. Um, and it's exciting that we've seen such a big decline in these infections. We think it started after a big 1993 fast food hamburger outbreak prompted the Department of Agriculture to declare this organism to be an adulterant in ground beef. And that followed big uh, overhaul in our meat inspection system. Um, and while this was all going on, we were finding more and more outbreaks that was resulting in a lot of publicity and a lot of ground beef recalls. In 2002, we had a really big ground beef recall. And after that, many companies began testing all lots of beef trim for 0157. And in fact, um, this decline that we see um, is paralleled by a decline in the percentage of ground beef uh, that's positive for 0157. So a uh, final success is listeria. Um, back in the 1980s, we had a very high incidence of listeria infections uh, per million population. Again, it's a rare disease, um, but we were up at around seven or eight per million people. Um, but look what's happened since then. If we add on the line of ready-to-eat meats positive, the decline that we see in listeria has paralleled the decline in the percent of processed meat that's positive for listeria monocytogenes. And we think this is because during this period of the decline, we found many listeria outbreaks. We identified hot dogs and deli turkey meats as a problem, and um, the Department of Agriculture and Industry made many changes to make these meats uh, safer. So we've talked about the high-risk groups for listeria, and CDC um, on our website has these uh, posters, uh, including what foods are risky. We think that deli meats and hot dogs are now less risky, but we're concerned about produce such as raw sprouts, raw milk, soft cheese, and smoked seafood as risk factors. So we've made significant progress in reducing foodborne illness. I've talked about listeria and E. coli 157. We also had um, some early success with Campylobacter. And in fact, for all of these organisms, the successes were mostly in the late 90s and early 2000s. And as a result of the decreases in 2010 alone, we estimate that over 500,000 illnesses were averted and about 100 million 
was saved in direct medical savings. So I've talked about CDC's role, about food safety challenges, and about successes that inspire and guide us. And I want to end with a quote from the Director General of WHO that um, next year, WHO will dedicate World Health Day to food safety to catalyze government and public action to put measures in place that will improve the safety of food from farms, factories, street vendors, and kitchens. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Griffin. <clears throat> well, 50% of poultry is contaminated with Campylobacter and 12% with Salmonella. It's quite serious. We need to pay a lot of attention to that. And a lot of it comes from safe food handling practices that are at the heart of preventing uh, illness as a result of these contaminated products. <clears throat> However, um, I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, Dr. Lynn Frewer, <laughs> Professor Frewer is Chair of Food and Society at Newcastle University, a public research university located in Newcastle-upon-Tyne in Northeast England. A good friend of Harry Potter's, I think. <laughs> Previously, she was Professor of Food and Society at Wageningen University in the Netherlands and Head of Consumer Science at the Institute of Food Research at Norwich in the UK. Dr. Frewer's research interests focus on understanding and measuring societal and individual responses to risks and benefits associated with food health, sustainability, and safety. Methodological innovation regarding the application of systematic reviews in the social science and agri-food governance and associated policy issues, including policy translation of scientific results and foresight. <clears throat> Dr. Frewer has had extensive involvement in EU and nationally funded projects, primarily in the area of social science and the agri-food sector. She has published more than 165 refereed journal articles and edited five books. She has also been involved in national and European research funding and strategy committees. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lynn Frewer. First of all, thank you to the organizers for uh, asking me to talk to you today. It's lovely to be in Washington. And I, I have to say, this is the first conference I've been to where I've wanted to go to every session, all of the parallel sessions. Everything is so fascinating. So, so I'm, I'm hopefully going to, to follow up on uh, a lot of the, the, the things that are being presented today. This is an amazing conference. So I was asked to talk to you about supporting consumers facilitating behavior that reduces risky behaviors. Um, before I go into the, in, into, the, into the talk, I'd like to say, following up on your excellent presentation, I'm certainly from a European perspective beginning to pick up conflicting policy issues. For example, policy relating to food security and sustainability and some of the behaviors that are appearing in people's homes. So the drive to keep foods for longer and perhaps store them inappropriately seems to be, while supporting sustainability, conflicting with people's promotion of health uh, in, in, in relation to food safety. So there are lots of areas where I think we need to do a little bit more research uh, to try and understand these changes as policy changes. How does this affect people? So thinking about risky behavior 
This might mean not adopting safe food preparation practices. It might also mean reducing the nutritional quality of the diet in, in response to perceived food risk. We're seeing a new, I don't think it's an APA-listed disorder of orthorexia, which means that um, people are excluding certain foods or eating foods which they perceive to be risky, uh, which might actually compromise their nutritional status. Um, the other issue which I'm going to raise is the rejection of potentially beneficial food innovations, which might also reduce people's risk in the home. And perhaps we can come back to that later. We have the classical risk analysis framework. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. Of interest to this particular meeting is the risk communication and stakeholder involvement in part of this. And what I'd like to highlight, of course, uh, also following on from the previous talk, is the interactive exchange of information and opinions. And increasingly, this is not just about how to communicate with particular stakeholder groups, it's about gathering data about outbreaks, about people being sick. So we get a better understanding of not only the path of foodborne illness, but also how effectively interventions are working. I'm coming from the UK, where there seems to be considerable pressure on the health services, which has resulted in reduced reporting of foodborne illness, but at the same time, a suspicion that in some areas there's an increase in, in, in illness. So using the social media, big data, to analyze trends in, in illness might also help us understand how effective risk communication is. You're all familiar with risk perception, that risk perception drives people's attitudes and that people react to risks in a way which may not necessarily be predictable uh, from technical risk estimates. So involuntary risks over which people have no control are more threatening than one people choose to take. In the area of food safety, one might think about the headlines associated with contamination from a restaurant compared to the incidence of um, headlines associated with food in, in, produced inside the home. Catastrophic risks concern people most. I'll come back to the issue of crisis communication later on. And unnatural or technological risks are much more threatening than natural ones. So that's like a, a shopping list of why it's difficult to communicate to consumers about taking self-protective measures. People perceive that they themselves have control over exposure to foodborne illness in the home. Often people aren't affected um, in large numbers, although that's not always the case. But the, the, the chronic incidence is one that people don't tend to think about. And of course, foodborne illness is largely perceived to be natural, so therefore less threatening. And uh, coming back to some of the, 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 the slides presented by um, our previous speaker, concerns about animal welfare, about natural production systems may, may also conflict with the emergence of some of these foodborne illness issues. I was quite fascinated by the, uh, the slides on raw milk, uh, where it's, it's clear that this represents a real threat, but nonetheless, one people perhaps either choose to take or filter out of their behaviors because it's seen as having or reflecting a food choice or consumption pattern with far bigger advantages. Now, I'm not sure because I haven't seen the data in the US whether this relates primarily to free-range animal welfare organic standards or simply the quality of the food that's produced. But something has to be done. So, 
We know that people underestimate the risks of food poisoning contracted in the home. And there are also risks associated with habitual food preparation practices. We know from European data that the percentage of people that would use a meat thermometer is a tiny fraction of those actually preparing meat, less than 5%. So developing communication messages which promote these kind of technological innovations is rather difficult because people haven't traditionally used these kinds of technologies in domestic food preparation practices. Um, the other thing I'd like to raise is that we have substantive evidence that people do not isolate food safety behaviors from other food safety behaviors. Uh, I'm originally a psychologist. We know that the people that the way people think about food risks tends to be cognitively interlinked. So on one hand, people have a lot of knowledge about food safety which they simply don't activate. So personally, I doubt that always giving them more information is going to result in them applying this information when they're preparing food. The second thing we know is that knowledge about food safety is linked to their knowledge about nutrition. And pulling up one set of pieces of information can, can link or trigger a whole set of other associations. So if you take a food scare, dioxins in the environment, we find that that also triggers information about how people prepare and think about food safety risks. So just isolating nutrition from food safety, from other types of food risk information, may not necessarily always produce the best behavioral response. And of course, trust, getting it wrong. I'm from Europe. This was a, a, a terrible event. The, the issue was not just about the loss of life. It was about blame and cultability. So Germany blamed the Spanish and the Spanish cucumber producers, who then tested their um, facilities, found no evidence of E. coli, and the culprit was these green sprouts being produced in Germany. The cost, in terms of the socioeconomic impact on producers in Spain, was immense. That was part of it. The other part was the decline in trust in the German authorities. Why were they trying to put the blame on producers in another country if they weren't trying to promote their own vested interest? Now, I have no idea if this is what they were thinking, but this was the interpretation. So communication, getting it wrong, trust and culpability, the perceived protection of economic interests. It's going to be extraordinarily important to also take this into account if you're a regulator or an industry when you're trying to get risk communication and food safety issues right. So, a quick summary. This is a paper in press, the result of a systematic review of everything that's been published, which met a certain standard about food safety and consumer and citizen risk perceptions and what this means for communication. There's some pretty established guidelines. Experts rely on technical risk assessment. They tend to communicate using scientific argumentation, which does not take account of socioeconomic impacts, but these are clearly important. What if, for example, people are eating risky foods in the home because they can't afford to buy products and throw it away. In theory, experts balance risk against benefits, but again, it's not always clear how socioeconomic benefits or even technical benefits are assessed if we come back to the, the classical WHO-FAO risk analysis framework. 
The public, of course, have to use their risk perceptions to make judgments about risk, and we all do this. When we're crossing the road, uh, we make some kind of probabilistic ass assessment, and when we cross the road at a crossing, we're trusting the driver of the car heading towards us to stop. We use a heuristic to decide whether a behavior is safety or not. People require risk communication to take account of their concerns as well as technical risk estimates. And emotional or effective responses are important. People get very emotional if some groups in the population are affected, particularly children, particularly the, 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 the vulnerable. And these are the messages which people tend to pick up from the social media. But everybody is at risk, and everybody is preparing food or at least involved with uh, people that do this. Let's go back a long time, the kind of images associated with BSE. This is where a lot of emotion resulted in a lot of restructuring globally. Um, we have a lot of issues still in Europe about traceability, labeling for animal welfare, and trust, and more recently, Horsegate, which was presented as a food safety issue, although there's no reason why, why, heat, why, why, why horses can't be consumed by humans. They are in some European countries. But which, as a consequence of being promoted as a food safety issue in the media, uh, meant that many commercial brands, here we see Findus, um, various large-scale companies having to, to engage in a full-scale food safety recall uh, on the basis of something which wasn't actually a food scare. Now, I'm a vegetarian. I wouldn't eat any of these things. Um, so I, I have a kind of excuse here. Uh, but again, the consequences of not quite understanding how consumers respond to some of these issues resulted in some very odd communication on the internet and the need for agencies concerned primarily with food safety having to address a non-food safety issue. So fraud and standards is inexorably entwined with some of these communication issues. Um, Horsegate, a food chain, the beef chain, were absolute, absolutely rigorous standards are expected to be applied. The public concern, certainly in Europe, now focuses on illegal economic gain, that somehow food chains and standards are being tampered with, uh, particularly aligned with criminal activity. And uh, although the issue, in a technical way, is not focused on food safety, apart from the possibility of some uh, veterinary um, drug residues in the food chain. Um, the public concern is, again, intermingling the safety issues with these broader issues of criminality, fraud, and traceability. So, th so this is important, and again, is something which needs to be addressed as a risk communication issue. So I'm going to finish with the systematic review and just report what we seem to know and what we don't seem to know. What we found was, first of all, that certain food issues were much more interesting to researchers and research sponsors than others in terms of risk communication research. So if you like, there are some orphan uh, foodborne illnesses which simply haven't been the topic of systematic risk communication research. For some reason, Campylobacter has been researched a lot. Um, e. coli, a moderate amount, and some of these much more, um, shall we say, not marginal, but threatening and emerging risk um, related diseases simply haven't been considered. 
What we also found was that pattern of research typically followed the occurrence of a crisis or a policy concern. So all you research funders there, um, it's perhaps a good idea to try and anticipate emerging foodborne issues and put the risk communication money there before they've emerged rather than follow on after the crisis has occurred. Three broad themes relevant to the development of best practice and risk-benefit communication, the characteristics of the target population, the contents of the information, and the characteristics of the information sources. Well, perhaps that's not so surprising. But the gaps that were identified. There's a need to consider the difference between communications under acute or chronic conditions. And if we're thinking about emerging disease risk, then the emerging issues uh, are likely to first meet the public in the context of something that's very acute. I think people behave very differently to risks which might be described as chronic, which are ongoing, and they also tend to habituate to the information. So something like hysteria or campylobacter, when you first start communicating, people are very interested. But as for any communication message, it, the, the impact of that message tends to drop off as time goes on. Now, we've been doing some research but where we're essentially using emotion as a carrier to try and get people to reinvestigate their knowledge about some of these chronic illnesses. And it works for a while. If you have pictures of people vomiting, um, it tends to get people to think about some of these uh, food risk issues. But people quickly habituate to that as well. It lasts, you know, a few months. Um, so, again, I would argue that we need to undertake analysis of the long-term impacts of communication interventions and not just the short-term ones and understand why people are engaging in benefit perceptions, sorry, in, in particular behaviors, which means looking at their benefit perceptions as well as their risk perceptions. Again, I was engaged by the raw oyster argument, which to me implies people are getting a lot of hedonic pleasure out of consuming something which is clearly risky. No advice, it's horrible. <laughs> um, all those warning signs in restaurants, but people are still engaging in that behavior because they like eating, eating oysters. So that's the driver. If we think about acute risks, um, they may be difficult to predict, so pre-planning is also difficult. What type of hazard will occur when, who will be affected? So here, there needs to be clear guidelines on the the process of communication, and they need to be generic because we don't know who, when, and why is going to be affected. With chronic risks, we have more information regarding the impact of the risk, who is affected, and it's more feasible to tailor messages according to people's perceptions and perceptions within target groups associated with both risk and benefit. The needs of those most affected, we need to understand risky behaviors in the home. We might need ethnographic methods to understand what people are doing rather than what they say they're doing because often there's an enormous mismatch between those things. And in terms of people's current behaviors and habits. So build risk communication about what people are doing but also understand what it is that is easy for them to change. Because telling them to use a meat thermometer might not be the easiest behavior, and it also might be the one which they find most difficult. So targeting communication to the perceptions and needs of at-risk groups, we need to understand their perceptions, because they may be very different to the rest of the population. And I'd like to introduce as well this idea of instrumental 
introduction of food risks, which have resulted in unintended consequences. Here, people start to become distrustful because a particular food risk is introduced to meet some other public health goal or to reduce prices or to deliver something that's beneficial. In a crisis, we need also to communicate about mitigation measures through the entire food chain, about what's being done to reduce the risk. Again and again and again in Europe, we see that food chain actors are not reporting a food risk until clearly people are affected, until perhaps people have died. It could be a month or two months after there was knowledge that, that risk was in the food chain. So, so why is that happening? And despite policy measures being introduced to reduce that, the rapid alert systems, that problem is still there. So communication about mitigation measures and related research activities is needed to reassure consumers and also ensure trust is reinstated. And also because the food chain is very broad, it's very long, it's very complex, we talk about food webs, communication about uncertainties, risk uncertainties, and what is being done to reduce these is needed in real time. And that would be true of any food scare. And that needs not only to reach the consumer at home, it also needs to exploit social media, and it also needs to, to, to reach all of those actors in the food chain, those with responsibility for food preparation in restaurants, uh, in, in other environments where food is being prepared. So sometimes I think a lot of effort on consumer education is good, but certainly in my part of the world, we also need to communicate with those other people with responsibility for consumer protection from food risk. And of course, deliberate contamination. We need to communicate about enforcement and identification of fraudulent, or deliberate um, introduction of foodborne illnesses into the food chain. Uh, and also understand that consumers may lose something from not consuming a particular food or switching to alternatives. So again, why are people doing what they do? Don't just tell them that what they're doing is wrong, but try and understand what's motivating them to engage in a particular course of action. I've seen some really interesting uh, breakout groups on the role of the social media. I don't understand what's going on. And I have no idea how you can measure the impact of social media. So I'm going to learn from you guys about how to measure this. So big data, uh, geography, demographic groups, identify emerging food risk issues. I'd like to just point out that the social media is not inclusive. In the UK population, there are 65 million people. Those active on Twitter, 15 million people. The ones that aren't active are probably the ones who are most vulnerable, the most excluded. So again, I plead don't rely on just the social media as a risk communication tool even though we've got our smartphones and it's, it's hot and sexy and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's one tool among many. And I was re recently talking to uh, a colleague from Birmingham who's an expert on uh, social media. Most people are who they side they are, but, but there are also people falsifying identities. And that might be industry actors or all sorts of people playing games with uh, statistics related to foodborne illness, but we just don't know. So some care. Finally, with social media, another warning, we're finding that the kind of social media that I'm familiar with are so unfashionable with my students, they just laugh at me if I say Twitter. There are other, other forms which people who are in the know really, really like to use. 
As soon as social media is institutionalized uh, by universities or perhaps government departments, it becomes less hot. So the real news is being broken on Tinder. Someone tell me what Tinder is. <laughs> you can talk to me in the coffee break, really, because this one's beyond me. Um, but the people that know are telling me this is the case. So again, we need to, to look at the social processes, which is, is driving um, how these messages are conveyed and who is being affected. So some principles of risk communication. Risk-benefit communication, variability and uncertainty, these need to be communicated together with risk management and regulatory priorities. What preventative measures are being taken by food chain actors, not just by consumers. And actions to, prepare, to improve future preparedness. When, as soon as a risk is identified, and this is what we're not doing in Europe, we need to get the information out by whatever means are available, social media, traditional media. And we also need to say what we don't know. If there are gaps in knowledge, be honest about the uncertainties. For many people, this is difficult because how do you explain that actually you're not in control? But to, 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 to make sure that people trust and also protect themselves, it's important. So when new identification, mitigation or prevention measures are being put into a place, these need to be put into the public domain. And I would still argue that we, we're not perfect at communicating in a crisis. We're far better than when BSE happened in 1996, which was perceived as repressing the truth about a food risk. But again, what's being done, how agencies communicate and coordinate their communications, uncertainty, how to get information to vulnerable populations who may be the most difficult to reach, particularly in a crisis, the location of risk in different food chains that needs to be conveyed, as well as the geographical location of the risk. And I just want to point out that in a real crisis, for example, a nuclear reactor goes up, there might be all sorts of risk communication issues, including that related to foodborne illness that needs to be conveyed quickly, but you won't have the internet because there'll be no electricity. So again, contingency measures to make sure that we're not relying purely on modern technology. So thank you. Any questions or comments? First of all, I've been asked to introduce myself. My name is uh, Brian Bedard. I am the executive director of the Grocery Manufacturers Science and Education Foundation. And if you're wondering what I'm doing and how I'm involved with the partnership, just, <laughs> I didn't realize I was doing so much with the partnership. Um, I'm a veterinary epidemiologist um, and I've been with the foundation now for uh, about a year. And we have a lot of complementary programs. Um, I'm also on the board of directors of the partnership and very pleased to be here. This is the first uh, conference I've been at and very excited to be involved with, with the partnership. Um, I've been involved in food safety and, and the, the agribusiness for many, many years. And one of the things we've learned is that, that the consumers of the future is where we have to focus our efforts um, to drive this food safety agenda. And the partnership, we know, is doing an outstanding job in that effort, and we're very pleased to be able to partner with them. Um, and I'd also like to thank the keynote speakers today. I think they've, they've done an excellent job at laying the groundwork here for us to get started. And, and what they've offered us today, I think, blends very well with, with the program and allows us to, 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 to uh, dive a little bit deeper into some of the elements that they've, they've talked about today. And I'd like to highlight just a few of the takeaways that, 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 that I, I um, um, got from their, their uh, presentations. Uh, in terms of, of the need for 
more data, big data, and the ability to analyze that data in much more powerful ways. And we see the CDC and other agencies doing that um, in terms of how they're analyzing data. We see them becoming more and more sophisticated, new technologies, and better, I think, better analysis of the data that then allows us, either through the work we're doing in the partnership and industry, to really target interventions so they really drive towards resolving um, uh, the issues that are, that are affecting us on a day-to-day -day basis. The mention about antibiotic residues, those of you that happen to have read the International uh, New York Times today, it's front and center article about, about the global risks of antibiotic resistance, particularly what's happening in India. It's quite shocking. Those of you that have time to have a look at that article, I would encourage you uh, to do so. Uh, and, and this Dr. Furr's presentation, I think, leads right into that. I mean, one of the things that, that we've learned, and I've heard several times say that if you, you lead with the science, you lose with the science. And it's an issue about dealing with consumers and how they behave and their behaviors. And it's something we're all learning in terms of what is going to drive food safety. Yes, there are better technologies, there are better processing technologies, there are, are better ways to train and teach people, but at the end of the day, what we need to get at is people's behavior. Let me give you a little personal example. I lived in China for 12 years and raised three children there. So we were very, my wife and I were very diligent about what they were fed. We had an organic farm with greenhouses. The, the three boys we raised were working on the farm so they knew uh, about the risks of food safety. They only drank imported milk and happened to be a veterinarian and not a vegetarian. Uh, I, I knew where the meat was coming from uh, so that it was safe. So we were being very, very careful. Yet I come home one day in the, early in the afternoon, there's two of my boys on the street corner buying meat sticks from the local vendor, street vendor, and eating them as fast as they could. He's cutting it up on an old piece of wood. And, and, and I said, what are you doing, boys? I said, oh, daddy, but it tastes so good, and it's so cheap. And those are the risky behaviors that, that, that uh, consumers are getting involved in. And from Dr. Fruer's presentation, you can see that, that there are, there's a lot of work yet to be done in that way in terms of driving this into what we're doing in the, in the companies we work with, for example, food safety culture is becoming front and center. And that whole food safety culture, I believe, needs to be, be expanded beyond that to consumers and well beyond. So without any further ado, I'd like to open the floor up to any questions you may have for our keynote speakers. I'm sure there are plenty. We have about 10 minutes before the break, <laughs> so please, if there are any questions, please uh, raise your hand. And anybody can help me to identify who the uh, questioners are. There is a microphone available. Are there any questions? First of all, I'd like, I'm Christine Bruhn, University of California at Thank Davis. You. I want to uh, repeat, I know what we all feel, these were excellent presentations, and a grand way to begin our program. Uh, I'm wondering, Dr. Griffin, are we focusing even too narrowly when we look at antibiotic resistance and looking, look at, at animal agriculture, do we have any data on how frequent it is for humans who have a particular prescription antibiotic who stop because they stop taking their antibiotic uh, before the 10 days or whatever because they are now feeling better? Uh, you know, I concur that that we need, we're focusing here on foodborne illness, but are we, should we broaden our view for other health communications to uh, direct some of these issues that are arising? Um, so yes, thank you for uh, broadening the topic. I focused just on pathogens that are transmitted commonly by food. In the antibiotic threats report that CDC published last year, the major focus is on um, bacteria that are not carried by animals that tend to be um, resistant because they've become resistant in a hospital environment or in other environments due to the overuse of antibiotics in human medicine. So that certainly is a major, major problem. But because we were focusing on foodborne illness, I focused on, um, on that particular part of it. So thank you for broadening that. Are there any other questions? 
Over here. Hello, I'm Joan Hagerfeld Baker. I'm the food safety specialist for SDSU, South Coast State University Extension. I've just this past few months I've served on the raw milk working group for South Dakota. It has not been pleasant, I can tell you. But <laughs> and there is nothing you can say or do, anybody that can bring that you can bring to the table when you're working with policy that can really get get this group to change their mind. I mean, you have data, you have all kinds of information, you can bring human interest stories, and there is nothing you can do, so, or that we found that we could do. So if you have anything that you can help in that area, I mean, I think this is a good idea where you're bringing you know, the, the CDC and the data together and the same panel with, with communicating risk. But it was just, I mean, it, I, I don't know what I could have done and what any, anybody could have done that were scientists sitting at that table. So any ideas you can share would be great. You first. <laughs> well, um, I was hoping you would come up with ideas and tell <laughs> us what to do. But I agree with you that, I mean, we, we have to try to acknowledge people's concerns and the reason that they're choosing raw, raw milk. Um, I would hope that we begin to get enough of those stories from people who are believers in the benefits of many aspects of a healthy diet and in incorrectly, I think, throw raw milk into that box and then suffer the consequences for themselves or their children. I, I, I'm hoping to get more of those stories. We have those stories on our website. And you're right, I'm not convinced that they have helped that much, but perhaps a real speaker uh, a leader in one of those groups who um, who suffered could help us. But You're Lynn's going to give us the answer. Okay. Oh. Or perhaps not. <laughs> um, it did occur to me, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a, an analysis of why people are choosing the raw milk, which is, is pulling up the values that they're applying to their decision making. There must be something associated with that particular purchase. Um, which outweighs um, the perceptions of risk in the decision-making that, that, that they're doing. I'm kind of thinking this is tied up with a whole raft of other value systems, so naturalness, organic production, I'm not sure. Well, and also, they politically, they would use it, it is their right to make that decision. And, yeah. and I... And I can agree with them, I guess, on, on that. So it came down to it. Everybody had to leave some skin at the table, and the Secretary of Ag for South Dakota ran the session. I mean, we had several sessions, and we all communicated very well together. I mean, I think I made some good friends. But what we came down to on one of the things that we will that they have to have if they're a raw milk producer is education. And so SDSU Extension will be developing that. And, and I think we're probably one of the first states that's going down that route. And I, mm. I'm kind of concerned on the, even what will happen with that. You know, what, um, will they think <laughs> that now we're risk-free? And so we have to really be careful how we develop that piece of education for the producers is something that, that I'm looking at. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two more questions over here. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, so Dr. Furrer, uh, I. I'm intrigued by this notion of, I think you called it orthorexia, is that correct? Yeah? Yes. And if you could expand a bit, of, about, uh, expand a bit on that, um, it seems to me that the whole gluten-free movement is sort of an example of that. Okay. And if you could talk a bit about what we understand as unrealistic optimism, the idea that bad things happen to other people and that that's a reason that people may engage in risky practices like eating oysters or drinking raw milk. So if you could talk about those okay. two things a bit. Um, I'll start with the orthorexia. I believe it's not yet formally been diagnosed as a, a medical condition, a psychiatric condition by the APA. But there's increasing evidence that people are restricting their diets in a healthy or what's perceived to be a healthy direction in a way which is actually resulting in malnutrition and, uh, and health problems. So excluding, and this also perhaps speaks to the raw, the raw milk issue, um, excluding anything that's not produced in a particular way, which isn't raw, 
um, perhaps incorporate some of the more extreme versions of diets. The Neanderthal diet is the one which I, or the Paleolithic diet, they're, they're two that I've come across. The one that seems, as you've mentioned, Bill, is the, the, the one that seems to be taking over at the moment is avoiding gluten. Because in some way, gluten is perceived to be unhealthy, which it is if you have celiac disease, obviously. But, but for, for normal people, I'm not quite getting uh, why, why that perception has arisen. And I suspect, again, it's linked up with a whole set of other values related to processing, resulted to associated with carbohydrate intake, all sorts of things which um, come together to, to, to promote what are actually likely to be unhealthy dietary practices. The most extreme form is, is when people simply won't eat outside of the home because they don't perceive that the food is uh, being produced in a, a healthy, natural way which aligns with the set of rules that somebody has pre produced. Whether that accompanies, well, whether that's really associated with foodborne illness or not, I'm not sure. But again, perhaps something like raw milk is, is aligned with that, that set of values. And I, I do think we need to look at entire value systems rather than trying to isolate um, particular beliefs because that's affecting how, how people behave and live their lives. Optimistic bias. Um, I was actually going to bring this into the breakout session um, that, that I'm also doing, so I, I'm going to steal my own thunder here. But many people perceive that a lot of this information is directed towards others who engage in risky behaviors, who often have higher perceptions of personal control over risk, and perceive themselves to be more knowledgeable than an average member of society. And we see it with all sorts of risk-taking behaviors. Uh, in the past, we observed it with smoking behaviors. People think risk messages about smoking are directed towards individuals who smoke far more than they do as individuals, um, sexual activity, all sorts of things. And I still think this is a major barrier to people taking notice of risk communication about foodborne illness, um, that the messages are perceived to be directed towards very vulnerable individuals or very ignorant individuals, and people simply don't attend those messages. There are various interventions which have been utilized to overcome those optimistic biases, but again, I think speaking to the long term rather than the short term, people very rapidly psychologically adopt and go back to doing what they always did. So a big gap in our research base is understanding the long-term impact of all of these information interventions. Um, I've been advised that uh, we have to, I apologize, we don't have any more time for more questions, but perhaps if you have, I'm gonna allow this one question, okay. the last question. <laughs> I, I I'm, I'm watching for the bullwhip though. Yeah, I have. <laughs> I have powerful nonverbals. Please go uh, ahead. Lynn Paul, Montana State University Extension. Actually, that was a great segue into my question, and that is when you look at risk communication, we're looking at ways in which to um, devise the message for behavior change. But I was thinking about what perhaps we need to look at those persistent messages that people take a that people have held on for decades. Yeah. And one example of that is the potato salad in the summer, okay? Now, I hear it all the time, I still hear it all the time. So why has that persisted long term? So if we can understand that, perhaps we can understand, as you said, the, the um, what do I wanna say, the, the effectiveness of that message long term. Yes. Do you see what my point is? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And very quickly, people sometimes take on board messages which they like and they're embedded in, in their cognition. And they're very, very difficult to change or shift. Gotcha. Um, and as new information comes to light, people dis disregard it because it's, it's cognitively difficult to process that information. And also they like to do what they've always done. It makes them feel comfortable. Yeah. So you're right, we need to examine that. Yeah. 
So we need to start with the unsafe practices of uh, potato salad in the summer and just go from there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Take good stop. Thank, thank you. Uh, so please join me once again in thanking the keynote speakers for getting us off to a great start.